Okay, so our next speaker is Deirdre Michalski. Deirdre is an assistant director at the National Children's Bureau, where she has lead responsibility for practice and participation. Um, she's going to talk about how child development perspectives can inform our approach to pupil wellbeing. Deirdre, are you there? I am. There we go. Okay, so I'll hand over to you for now. Thanks so much. Thank you, David. Um, thanks, everybody. Lovely to be here on an evening, and which I know is at the end of another big, long day of work for all of you. Um, a bit like uh, Emma, we got an invitation to take part in this evening's work. I've been doing a good wee bit of work in the last while on thinking about emotional health in the positive sense and mental health, I suppose, in terms of um, how pupils and teachers and parents and families are experiencing the return to school, especially here in Northern Ireland. So um, I suppose I'm framing what I'm saying in terms of what we know, uh, I suppose uh, our interest at, at National Children's Bureau is thinking about how we get the best evidence closest to children and people who support them in, in um, their development and also then what we do with that like in the service settings that we have. So what do we know and what we know about our children is that uh, 45,000 children in Northern Ireland have mental health problems and that around half of those um, develop those problems before the age of 14. Um, so we know a lot about the mental health issues that you will be familiar with in schools, but we know significantly less about um, the positive well-being or the general well-being of our pupil population. So what we do know about, I suppose, is what works and it's about trying to shift our focus back to thinking a lot of a lot of what Emma says really has resounded with me in terms of understanding relations relations and day to day interactions with children to be core to this. So there are huge resources out there. Um, there are going to be more. Um, both the department and SIA, uh, EA already have a portal up there. There's a huge amount of resources out there. If anything, I think teachers are probably experiencing an overload of information. So I'm cautioning around add, adding to that. I'm not going to put the resources up there. I see people referring to Dr. Karen Treesman's work and we work with Karen as well. It's definitely a fabulous place to go. But you will find your own way um, to the resources that you think resound for you and that you see fit for your children in your classes and your schools. That, that's your professional judgment. And I think one of the things that could be happening unless we um, unless unless we make a concerted effort not to do it is that that professional that that confidence in the professional self could feel overwhelmed or lost in an environment that's full of new guidelines and procedures so i suppose um that's that first sense of confidence in yourself and a kind of courage and compassion and curiosity for yourself and the children and families that you're working with is is probably key to all of this. And we're talking pupil mental health, but the link between that self-care and children's mental health is all about brain development. So what we now know is that the mirror neurons and the way that the, the, the brain development happens for young children is that so much of what they come to understand of themselves and what they come to understand in terms of their own capacity uh, and how they can fulfill that comes from what they see us doing so that those examples of the teacher who doesn't get a break, who doesn't have water, who um, doesn't maybe feel that the environment created for him or her in school is one in which they can talk about being tired or overwhelmed or saying or naming their emotions, which are frustration or disappointment in the day. The expectation that the children in our classes could develop that emotional literacy and, and that language of emotions that we need them to have is unrealistic we have to put ourselves in a place that might feel quite vulnerable so i've looked a wee bit um in terms of some of the work that we're doing about what do we know that works here so one of the things we know is that whole school approaches are really really key you can be a champion and work in that individual environment and there is no doubt that the lives of children are changed by those individuals that um, work with them and support them in, in their journeys. It takes that one teacher, but to be that teacher in an environment that isn't otherwise responsive to the way in which you're working, it, you know, that, that's the imploding that we were talking about earlier. That's what we want to avoid. So what we know is that whole school approaches where there, there's an underpinning supportive policy um, and where the leadership of the school demonstrates that courage and compassion and curiosity that we're talking about. 
th those kind of those are like legs on the stool if you like so th they also come and i suppose these are some of our challenges they also come with a need to prioritize that professional learning you know we we, we look and we have looked before at the type of um the extent of child development um, knowledge that teachers receive in your initial teacher training and education mostly those are there in optional additional modules they're there for you to specialize in if you choose to so I think there's that kindness to yourself to, to not presume that you have all of the knowledge but if you want to acquire it it's certainly out there and the instincts um, and professional judgment that you um, allow yourself to, to rely upon will bring will bring you to that space it's, um, so that that's about that that's I suppose about prioritizing the professional um staff development around around this area of work. I think the other half of that is then thinking about the whole child and an ecological approach. And there's been a lot of debates over the years about where schools sit in, in the ecology of the child and um how we work with parents um or how our system is even set up to allow us the time or relationships um that we need to develop with parents. But that, that's totally key. I think trying to see ourselves and starting from the child out and seeing what life looks like to them, where the supportive adults are for them, whether they would see us as one of those um, supportive adults, because it's in those, it's in that modeling of healthy behaviors and healthy relationships that children will come uh, to develop their own sense of themselves and what they should expect for themselves. So again, that, that's harking back to the self-care, um, I suppose. But it's seeing ourselves, it's seeing ourselves in that relationship and, and understanding that however our system is set up, the divide is false to say that our relationship is only with the child or um, you know that that we're only fulfilling a certain uh, responsibility um with the child so i think that's really challenging for us as teachers because it feels like a stretch it feels like we're being asked to be a whole lot of things and i suppose it's not it's about how we view teaching and learning and um it's about individual uh, responses to children in our classes so I appreciate those are those are huge challenges when you maybe have as there is in my son's p2 32 children who at the minute are in a mobile all day long um, and aren't out and about and don't have the freedom that they might have of, of school so there's kindness there's kindness to ourselves as, as well as to those children and I think understanding some of when we're talking about emotional well-being what we mean in terms of the core components helps us be less overwhelmed by the sense of what is it that I'm being asked to do because if we break that down and say it's about self-awareness it's about self-esteem and um, it's about self and co-regulation it's about problem solving and motivation then those are all the things that we know we're trained to support children to do that's what the curriculum is there to help you know it's based around those skills for children so breaking down some of the language that has grown up around emotional well-being and mental health that sounds a bit like it's specialist or it's somebody else or we might not be the people who know the most about it I think is helpful as well to say actually this is the stuff I know how to support a child in terms of how they see themselves and how they build relationships with their with their with their peers and others and I suppose something that Emma said at the start there with it or at the end with the Karen Treesman quote made me think of another one which is children learn and grow within and because of relationships so that, that's the fundamental and when we break it back down to there it is the small day-to-day -day interactions that we have and it is the self-forgiveness and the saying sorry to a child for those snappiness and for those things that, that people talked about in the chat at the beginning and acknowledging that we can experience as much frustration or disappointment um in the in the day as children do and when when you create that environment of um emotional literacy uh I think children respond to that and can say, you know, yeah, maybe maybe you could have a glass of water, or maybe you should have a sit down in the comfy chair for thirty seconds if that's what if that's what children do um, or other. There's some lovely stuff, and I'm going to put things in the chat. I'm conscious of time as well. There's some, um, I think, challenging but really interesting pieces of work out there, as I've said. But one one that I've been reading a lot um, is from the Harvard. Um, university center on the developing child and it kind of it's, it's a development piece of work one is an earlier paper and there's a subsequent um uh, paper off the back of it but it speaks around three underpinning principles for 
programs, services, interventions, however, and inclusive of education in that about when we seek to to improve outcomes for children and families, which is essentially what we're doing um, as educators. The, there are kind of three core principles that they ask us to think about, whether that's in the day-to-day interaction with that child or it's in our it's in our teaching and learning plans or it's in our school development plan. And they talk about seeking to develop or support and support responsive relationships, which we've talked a good wee bit about. The second pillar is around strengthening core life skills. And again, I've said that is when we break it down, that's what, what we're trying to do is, is develop resilience and problem solving and motivation for children. And the third is reducing the sources of stress. Now, we can't solve poverty and we can't so, solve, solve the poor home, but we, in terms of the quality of housing or experiences that children might have, but we can be responsive to them and make school a less stressful place to be where children whose circumstances might be adverse feel more confident, positive about coming to school and they feel like they belong and that teachers, that that's a place where you can be honest about what's going on for you and how you feel about that and how that might be affecting, um, might be affecting your learning. So I suppose I'll finish up. Um, uh, there's, there's huge amounts of stuff right there. We're supporting, um, depart- we have supported the department around developing a framework for um, emotional well-being for children in schools and that, that's going to be invested in the minute. But I suppose my messages are a bit, they're not dissimilar to, em- to Emma's in as much as the confidence in our professional selves that we're here because we want to do it here at this time of night because you want to do it because you believe that that relationship with the child is the one in which they will learn and grow and develop their full their full potential seeking to give ourselves um whatever knowledge or skills we can around um around that responsibility and it is one but also modeling the behaviors and i'd say of anything that's probably the key thing is is modeling the healthy behaviors and relationships that we hope to see children grow in and whether that's with our teaching peers or it's with children children themselves because they're they remain the smallest not not just physically but they're the smallest in terms of the power and agency that they hold in our schools you know um, they're not going to set the times of the meetings as I've said or, or the time that they come or go from school but how they feel when they're there how they feel about themselves will become part of how they who they become and how they feel about other people and interact with other people so we're in a place of huge opportunity i think courage and compassion and curiosity are are where we're at and there, there's a fourth c it's challenge and i acknowledge that but um i'm as happy as um uh, to put some things in the chat here and then to put contact details in as well if you're interested in some of the work that we're, that we're doing but otherwise I think David I'm probably up on time and we'll um, get questions after or something. That's great Deirdre thank you very much.